cameos, classic cars, and a made-up brand of cigarettes. Before the MCU, there was the Tarantino-verse, a world jam-packed with Easter eggs that you won't want to miss. Quentin Tarantino is fond of bringing recurring elements across his filmography, with one of the most famous examples being fictional brands. One of the most prominent is Red Apple Cigarettes. Introduced in Pulp Fiction, the fictional cigarette brand is smoked by several different characters in the 1994 film. A pack of Red Apples. Filters? No. The cigarette brand also makes appearances in The Hateful Eight and the Tarantino helm sequence from 1995's anthology film Four Rooms. Other notable in-film advertising for Red Apple cigarettes includes a Japanese billboard glimpsed in Kill Bill Volume 1 and an end credit scene from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. One of the big mysteries of Kill Bill Volume 1 revolved around the name of Uma Thurman's vengeful protagonist, referred to in the film and its marketing as The Bride. Whenever the character's name was mentioned in Volume 1 in the first half of 2004's Kill Bill Volume 2, it was audibly censored to maintain the mystery. Hi, honey. I'm Mr. Steves. What's your name? However, the bride's full name is revealed in Volume 1, long before the villainous L Driver announces it in Volume 2. You just need to be really focusing on the screen to see it. After regaining consciousness in an El Paso hospital, the bride orders a one-way plane ticket to travel to Okinawa, intending to obtain a katana from retired swordmaker Hattori Hanzo. In a blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment, the printed plane ticket clearly has the name Beatrix Kiddo displayed in the top corner. Tarantino made his feature-length directorial debut with 1992's Reservoir Dogs, a relatively low-budget crime film following a group of thieves in the aftermath of a disastrous jewelry store heist. One of the many elements that made the film stand out was Tarantino's decision not to show the actual robbery. In a flashback, viewers briefly glimpse a chaotic aftermath, and judging by a mistake in that sequence, perhaps it's better that most of the film is dialogue inside a nondescript warehouse. As Mr. Pink recounts how he barely escaped from the police after the botched heist, he can be seen sprinting down a busy Los Angeles street with the cops in pursuit on foot. After pushing his way past two pedestrians, the film crew's reflection is visible in a storefront window in the background from the camera crew themselves to a boom mic used to capture the chaotic audio. A seasoned filmmaker likely would have seen such potential for error and employed some kind of obfuscation technique, but since Tarantino was a rookie, his mistakes survived the final cut. In a way, perhaps that exemplifies the hurried thrill of early 90s indie cinema. Tarantino has included nods and homages to spaghetti westerns in his work for years, and leaned into these influences for his own Django Unchained. The 2012 film stars Jamie Foxx as the titular freed slave, determined to rescue his wife Broomhilda from the sadistic plantation owner Calvin Candy. Posing as a man interested in buying a slave for gladiatorial fights, Django meets with Candy, who is in competition with a rival slave owner, played by veteran spaghetti western actor Franco Nero. Nero played the original version of the character in the 1966 spaghetti western film Django. In a visual reference to Nero's spaghetti western, he wears bright white gloves a nod to Nero's iteration of Django having his hands maimed over the course of the 1966 film. D-J-A-N-G-O. The D is silent. I know. With Kill Bill being told out of chronological order, the first assassin that the bride takes her revenge on isn't Bernita Green, as shown in the Volume 1 opening, but Oren Ishii. In the four years that the bride was rendered comatose by the cabal of global assassins, Oren seized power as one of the most powerful Yakuza leaders in Japan. After the bride cuts through Oren's private army at a Tokyo restaurant, the two former associates engage in their own private duel, with Oren correctly predicting how long the fight will last. While Oren is surprised that the bride wields a sword forged by the retired Hanzo, she estimates that the impending duel won't last five minutes. Then Oren is correct in her prediction, but not in the way that she anticipated. The bride cuts off the top of her head, killing her after a hard-fought battle. The length of the sword fight is exactly 4 minutes and 59 seconds, fulfilling Oren's lethal prophecy. The most prominent storyline in Tarantino's Pulp Fiction is one that follows hitmen Vincent Vega and Jules Winfield through Los Angeles. While retrieving a briefcase belonging to their employer Marcellus Wallace, Vincent and Jules get into a gunfight with an unnamed character looking to avenge his friends. Surprising the two assassins, the character completely unloads a pistol at them, but every bullet strikes the wall behind Vincent and Jules instead. In an oversight that made it into the final film, the bullet holes in the wall behind Vincent and Jules are present before the shooting even begins. This suggests that the scene of Vincent and Jules talking in front of the bullet-ridden wall was filmed before much of the following sequence. The claims from Jules that divine intervention saved him and Vincent from mortal harm is a bit undercut by the knowledge that the bullet holes were there all along. The opening title sequence to 1997's Jackie Brown sets the tone for Tarantino's adaptation of Elmore Leonard's 1992 novel Rum Punch. 
From its grainy, color-saturated cinematography and Pam Greer's casting, to the 1973 Bobby Womack song Across 110th Street, Tarantino pays direct homage to 70s blaxploitation cinema. The memorable sequence would later be featured in a direct callback by Tarantino in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Jackie Brown opens with the titular protagonist moving confidently through a brightly colored, tiled hallway in LAX, before breaking into a run to board with flight passengers on time at the gate. The same hallway is featured in Once Upon a Time, when Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth make their triumphant return to Los Angeles with Rick's new wife, Francesca. In both sequences, the characters exude a sense of cool as they move through the airport, quietly hinting at their status quo before their respective narratives kick into high gear. Given how the late actor and martial artist is depicted in Once Upon a Time, Tarantino has a complicated stance regarding the legacy of Bruce Lee. However, Lee received a decidedly more favorable nod in Kill Bill Vol. 1, with the bride's choice in fashion during her stay in Tokyo. From her cruise through the city on her motorcycle to her memorable sword fight in the House of Blue Leaves, the bride wears a black and bright yellow tracksuit and helmet evocative of Lee. This iconic outfit is a visual homage to the martial art legend's similar ensemble in his posthumously released final film Game of Death in 1978. The bride's iteration of the yellow and black outfit would become one of the most recognizable images of the character, where they're wearing the tracksuit on the Volume 1 theatrical poster. How would the bride fare against Cliff Booth? Possibly better than Bruce Lee did. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood blends real-life figures and true events in the 1960s entertainment scene with fictional characters and twists on established history, all in service to Tarantino's love letter to 1969 Los Angeles. A prime example of the blur between actual history and Tarantino's imagination occurs when Rick Dalton takes an extended sojourn in Italy, starring European films. Among the filmmakers that Rick works with while in Europe is a real director, one amusingly name-dropped in Tarantino's 2009 film Inglorious Bastards. While infiltrating a Nazi film premiere in Paris, Allied soldier Donny Donowitz uses the alias Antonio Margariti while posing as an Italian director at the event. Antonio Margariti is an actual Italian filmmaker who directed feature films from 1960 to 1989. He is also credited in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood for casting Rick in the fictional movie Operazione Dynamite. Margariti. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is a lavish, painstakingly faithful recreation of Los Angeles in 1969, drawing from Tarantino's own memories of the city. One of the most prominent elements he includes in the film are the classic cars that Cliff Booth drives around LA, one belonging to himself and the other to his best friend and boss, Rick Dalton. In obtaining these throwback automobiles, Tarantino revisited some of the cars he had memorably used in his past projects. Rick is chauffeured around the city in his yellow 1966 Cadillac Coupe de Ville by Cliff after receiving a DUI prior to the events of the film. That car was previously driven by Mr. Blonde in 1992's Reservoir Dogs. The actual car is owned by Michael Madsen, who personally lent it to the production. Cliff himself, meanwhile, drives a blue 1968 Volkswagen Carmen Ghia, the same make and model previously driven by The Bride in Kill Bill Vol. 2. Much like Alfred Hitchcock and other directors before him, Tarantino has made it a point to cameo in many of his movies. It's a fun tidbit for Tarantino fans to look out for, and one where he might have a slight advantage over other filmmakers. After all, Tarantino considered himself an actor for many years, and a star in films like From Dust Till Dawn and Destiny Turns on the Radio. Appearing as Mr. Brown in Reservoir Dogs, Tarantino delivered the film's opening riff on Madonna and was quickly dispatched. In Pulp Fiction, the filmmaker played coffee-loving Jimmy, who was willing to help with the body disposal as long as it went down before his wife Bonnie got home. Tarantino briefly popped up as the bar owner in Death Proof, and Django Unchained brought along what might have been the most sizable role he gave himself, an explosives-obsessed Australian? One overlooked role is in the closing segment of Four Rooms, in which he lays out the terms of a bloody wager inspired by an old Alfred Hitchcock Presents episode. More subtle Tarantino cameos include a voice on an answering machine in Jackie Brown, a dead Nazi in Inglorious Bastards, and narration for The Hateful Eight. Did he have a cameo in Hollywood? Supposedly, that's him screaming cut at the end of the Dalton commercial. And cut. All right, this cigarette piece of fucking shit. And in Kill Bill, some think he was one of the crazy 88. Though it isn't explicitly stated within the films themselves, Tarantino has created familial links between some of the figures in his filmography. Mr. Blonde's real name in Reservoir Dogs is revealed to be Vic Vega, whom Tarantino has claimed to be the brother of Vincent Vega from Pulp Fiction. In various interviews over the years, Tarantino has alluded to the fact that he once had an idea for a Vega Brothers movie that would bring Michael Madsen and John Travolta's characters together, but like many Tarantino ideas, it never came to fruition. 
Tarantino's penchant to weave hidden family histories would later continue with his historical films. In Bastards, Michael Fassbender's British intelligence officer Archie Hickox is related to duplicitous outlaw English Pete Hickox in Hateful Eight. As for recurring names in Tarantino's initial films, it's no secret that he wrote his earliest scripts during overlapping periods, some with the expectation that they might not get made. It's unsurprising, then, that Jimmy in Pulp Fiction and Mr. White in Reservoir Dogs share the surname Dimmick, and Tom Sizemore's natural-born killer's detective and Blonde's parole officer in Reservoir Dogs are both Scagnetti. What may have started as unintended script shorthand, it seems, has become a Tarantino trademark. One of Tarantino's favorite collaborators in recent years has been Kurt Russell, who appeared prominently in The Hateful Eight and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The two first got together for Death Proof, with Russell playing against type as a serial killer named Stuntman Mike, who preys on young women, using his own modified car as a murder weapon. Death Proof contains several references to Russell's own long-running career, all while subverting audiences' expectations about his tendency to play heroic roles. When Stuntman Mike introduces himself, he reveals that he previously worked long ago as a stuntman on the television series The Virginian. As a child actor, one of Russell's earliest roles was on an episode of The Virginian, with the reference being a nod to Russell's acting origins. A more subtle reference to Russell's career in Death Proof is his character Jack Burton's white tank top from Big Trouble in Little China, hung up on the wall of the Austin Dive Bar where he stalks his prey. 